Okay. Have you finished now? No, no, well, listen. Um, and it, I'm no, 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 I'm, 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 I just I'm want to make sure. A, I'm I, want to, I, want to make, I want to make sure you're finished because I didn't want to interrupt you. Okay. Um, the, the two things. Firstly, Ed, you deny that the market would have any role in school improvement, and then I just quoted from a speech, and I discovered this is an argument you've made consistently, saying that the market does have a role in school improvement. Now, you then say, you then say that I believe only in the market. Well, that's just not so, given some of the things which I discussed earlier, some of the things which we're going on to discuss. There's a role for the state in improving teacher quality. There's a role for the state in making sure that the national curriculum provides an appropriate benchmark. There's a role for the state in guaranteeing resources to the poorest. There's a role for the state in helping to enhance the prestige and esteem of the teaching profession. There's a role for the state in making sure that we have um, exams that you can trust and an inspectorate that works. So, again, I underline the point. In a general election period, you would like to caricature my position. That's fair enough. But what I think is a little unfair is when you caricature the position in Sweden. Now, the TES had the opportunity to send a reporter to Sweden, and as Jared pointed out in the leader that accompanied that article, it is the case that many of the allegations that you've made about education in Sweden are wrong. Yes, there are criticisms that can be made of what's been happening in Sweden, but they're not the criticisms that you choose to make. More broadly, we know that school choice, not just in Sweden, but in America, and in Canada, and in Finland, and in Singapore, has played a part, not the sole part, but a part in raising standards. And you yourself have acknowledged that. It was acknowledged in the preface and in the arguments of the Education White Paper that was published in 2005 by Tony Blair and your predecessor, Ruth Kelly, and it's an argument which I wholeheartedly endorse. Anyway, um, on the questions about school leaders and the social partnership, um, I do believe that... Um, the best way in which we can encourage professional development is through peer-to-peer -peer engagement. I do think that the most inspirational figures when it comes to generating an improvement in school leadership are other school leaders. When I was fortunate enough to be able to address the Association of School and College Leaders, I took the opportunity to praise the NLE programme, which the National College has been responsible for. I think it's wholly admirable. One of the things that I have said is that if schools acquire academy freedoms, and we would like existing schools, which are already doing a good job to do so, the one precondition of them doing so is that they partner another school, which may be weaker, I wouldn't want to use any other description of it, um, in order to help ensure that that school benefits as well, that greater freedom for the strong is there to help the weak. So I absolutely believe that a culture of collaboration, which has grown up, and I'm honest about this, over the last 15 years, is a culture that we should build on. Um, on the social partnership, well, I do believe that it's vitally important that any government maintains a good and strong relationship with the professional associations that are responsible, not just for teachers, but for all those who work in our, um, our schools. Um, I recognize that there are conflicting views within those professional associations about the value of the social partnership. Rather than being tied down to one particular model of engagement, I would like to build on what works, and I would like to get the best possible professional relationships with all professional associations. As you know, John, I don't entirely agree with the NUT on everything. We have a well-advertised difference, for example, on key stage two tests. But I have always found all of the teaching unions and the wider bodies that represent the education workforce to be capable of doing two things very well simultaneously not just defending the interests of their members, but contributing to a broader debate about educational improvement. And what I'd want to do is to make sure that we had the most inclusive, the most respectful, and the most effective way of um, maintaining dialogue. So I don't come to the social partnership with any ideological animus, but nor do I regard it as something which is so sacrosanct that it can't be improved. Thank you, David. Let me start on the social partnership because it sounds like that might be the easier one to get uh, some sort of consensus on. Um, I have to admit, when I first heard that there was a social partnership, when I became the spokesman for education, I was fairly astonished because up, up to then it was, it was well below my radar screen. And my immediate reaction was this sounded a little bit like back to beer and sandwiches. Was this a good thing? Was this actually going to end up being a conspiracy in some ways against parent and pupil interests? And listening to actually what, what happens and viewing from the outside what's gone on. I've changed my mind about that. I think it's entirely sensible for professional bodies to sit around with the government on a regular basis and to discuss issues. I suspect, fingers crossed, that it's helped to improve the state of industrial relations over recent years. And I think that we started from quite a low base in terms of people's perspective 
on teachers sometimes in industrial action. And that cannot be in anybody's interest, least of all the teaching profession. So I would like to see the social partnership continue, but on two conditions. Firstly, I want it to be as inclusive as possible. There's obviously a history that you're, all of you are aware about. And I don't think it should be some kind of body where you have to sign up to 10 points of agreement before you're in it. People should be in it. They should be able to discuss things. If they disagree, they should be able to disagree. And the second thing is we need to acknowledge that ultimately... Um, you, in the social partnership, if you're a professional body, have your interests of your members you know, first at the top of your list. Any government is going to have the interests of the wider educational community. There aren't always going to be agreements on everything, and we need to recognize that, that sometimes that there will be a difference of view. The first question is really the, the, whole, the critical issue for schools, isn't it? Because if we could, as politicians, guarantee that there were some of these outstanding teachers in all 23,500 schools in the country, then frankly, even with debates about funding and goodness knows what else, you know, most of this would be fixed and actually we could shut up and occupy our time as politicians with something else. It is the problem that we haven't been able to guarantee good leadership and good teachers in every single school and a good quality of education that's led from the school that has caused all this micromanagement in education over the last 20 years. And we do now have some different visions. And Michael has accused Ed of, of over-dramatizing or characterizing these. And there's a certain element of truth in, the, in that. But it's also, there's also a certain element of truth in the characterization. And that is, you can either give freedom and you can, have, and you can rely very heavily on the market and you can uh, get rid of the, of, the, of the intermediate tier of local accountability and hope that that will work. Or you can have a very top-down approach, as the one that we've had from the government over the last 10 or so years, of thinking that you can run 23,500 schools centrally. Or you can have some system of intelligent accountability and strategic local oversight. And, of course, let new providers come in if they're capable of doing so. But do not think, and this, I think, is the lesson of Sweden, and I don't know whether Michael has read the latest edition of the TES, which is out this week, which gives, I think, a far more balanced view of what's gone on in Sweden. The idea, and I say this as a liberal who is very happy for new providers to come into the system, but the idea that this will automatically fix the system is wrong and it's naive. There will still be schools in challenging catchment areas where there are not competitor schools that are established. And if we leave this to the market, we will leave young people in those areas, particularly where parents are not willing or not able to shop around with a third-rate education. And we need much more freedom in the system. We also need to be able to bring good schools to the poorest areas. And the only way we can do that is by granting additional freedom, but by having intelligent accountability that is not exercised by some powerful Secretary of State trying to run 23,500 schools, because none of us are capable of doing that, whether it's Ed, whether it's me, or whether it's Michael. Thanks, David. Right, let's try this side of the room. Uh